Hello. Hello. Hey there, Bethel. Hey, guys. Hey. All right. Good morning, Bethel. I'm so glad you're here. This is our second week in our series in the book of Colossians called Christ to the Center. There are lots of noises and lots of obstructions that can pull us away from what's most important right now. As we enter into this second week of studying the book of Colossians, let me remind you, Colossians was written to a group of people in the city of Colossae by a guy named Paul. And Paul had encountered God and had a drastic life change. He had gone from a man who was imprisoning people for sharing the gospel to a man who was planting churches for the gospel. And he had met a man named Epaphras who had told him about a church that he had planted. And Epaphras had shared with him some of the struggle. And Paul is now reacting to that. Paul is, I believe, this is the most important part of the book of Colossians. It's kind of the point, the purpose. Have you seen all of these videos with dads, like saving their kids from imminent danger, like cat-like reflexes, superhuman speed, videos like this? Here is a picture of dad running super fast like Bo Jackson. <laughs> Here is dad. Oh, a kid almost fell off horse. Dad, go dad. Oh, this swing is always bad for business. Ah, inadvertent flip. Dad catch kid. It's great. Oh, what a nice cake you make with your mother. Ah, catch dad. Oh, let's see how much dirt we can knock down. Oh no, cave in. Oh, dad takes the dirt for the boy. <laughs> and there you go. You have just a swing in. Oh, dad catch by the feet. Oh, dad is asleep on the couch. Ah! Little guy, go head first. Your head is so heavy when you're little. Just a swing in. Me and Charlie Johnson by the neighborhood. <laughs> oh, good catch, Dad. The swing chain break. Oh, he's sledding. Oh, oh no. He's about to cry. So videos like that where the dad sees him at danger and he kind of swoops in to save the day. I think Paul is really trying to do the same thing with the church in Colossae. Like he sees a drift happening. Like Jesus had been the center of what had created this church. It had been about the grace of God and this Jesus. And now Paul is seeing and hearing from Epaphras that there's this drift occurring. And the drift is occurring in that people are wanting to add something to the gospel. The drift is happening in that they're wanting to kind of say, well, it's Jesus plus all the law in order to follow God. And then there is the other side. It's like, well, Jesus is kind of like all the other gods. He's just another God. And Paul is saying, no, 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 no. It was Jesus. It is Jesus. It's always been Jesus. The center needs to be Jesus. Paul is saying it is a dangerous place to go, a dangerous drift to put anything in the place of Jesus. You know, we really do love to hear what we want to hear. We love for people to tell us what we want to hear. I mean, we don't ask, does this shirt look okay? Because we want people to be like, no, you look like a busted can of biscuits. We want to hear, oh yeah, looks good, looks fine. But we all know the people who really love us won't let us walk out in public with our fly down. We, we all know that while we want to hear what we want to hear, that the people who love us tell us what we need to hear. And Paul is going to say some things. He's going to use his platform as a man of God who's actually in prison during the time of this. Paul is in prison, and while he can't go visit them, he is able to write them a letter and utilize the influence that he has been given over a period of time as a Christ follower. And so he writes this letter, 
And he tells them not so much what they want to hear, but what they need to hear. It's my hope as we listen today that we wouldn't listen for the parts of Scripture that we want to hear, but to listen to the part that God would give to us out of his love for us that we need to hear. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 1, Paul begins by saying, I want you to know how hard I am contending for you. Paul is saying, I want you to know how much I'm fighting in the battle with you for Christ. And for those at Laodicea, that's a church that he's mentioning. He says, and for all those who have not met me personally, look, I know that I'm in prison. I know that I couldn't come there in the middle of your, your division, but, but I am sharing this word with you. Paul is saying, my goal, I love it. When you write a research paper, when you write a sermon, at some point you have to kind of come down to brass tacks and say, this is what I am trying to do. Here at Bethel, our goal each and every week is to give you an opportunity to encounter the real Jesus. That's our goal. At the end of the day, we believe you could uh, encounter us and miss the point. You could encounter a service and miss the point. But if you encounter Jesus, it will change your life. Paul was evidence of that, but he says, my goal is, is that they may be encouraged in heart and united in love. Paul is trying to bring them together so that they can be encouraged and united and move forward. So that they may have the full riches of, of complete understanding. One of my favorite things to do when I get a new vehicle is to push all the buttons. Have you ever owned something for a while and then somebody like got in your car and pushed a button and you're like, I didn't know it would do that. Paul is trying to show the church in Colossae, hey guys, there's more than what you're experiencing. He says, so they may have the full riches of complete understanding. Yes, God has given you Jesus. He has risen from the dead. You have had an encounter with him, but he's not necessarily just after a one-time encounter with you. He's after walking with you, being a part of your life. And he says, so you'd have complete understanding in order that they may know the mystery of God, namely Christ. What he's saying is, my ultimate goal here is that you all can begin to be the church that looks like Jesus so that people will know who Jesus is. So that you will be, for people, people will encounter Jesus when they encounter you. That's Paul's goal here, to get the church in a place as to where it begins to look so much like Jesus that people experience the kingdom of God when they rub elbows with it. He says, namely Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. What he's saying here is that wisdom doesn't come from your old philosophy of God that one group in this church had. And wisdom doesn't come from all the old law that they used to uh, ascribe to. He's saying All the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are available in Jesus. I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. Now, parents, you're driving down the road. You got the family on a road trip. You're on your way to have fun. Do you just randomly address things that aren't happening in the car? Like the kids are being peaceable in the backseat of the car. They're acting good. They're coloring in their coloring books, looking at their Kindle whatever your kids do in the car. Do you ever turn around in those moments where everything's going right and be like, hey, don't make me stop this car. You don't, do you? The the reason that you say, keep your hands to yourself, don't make me stop this car, is because you're about to stop the car. And Paul is talking to them about the deception that is taking root in their midst. And that deception comes from two groups. Both of them trying to add something to Jesus or add Jesus to something. One of them is a group that is kind of had a polytheistic background. They met Jesus and then they started to gravitate away from the clear and central message of Jesus toward the other gods. And like, well, yeah, Jesus is another God. And they began to push them to worship 
angels and things that were not quite God. It was like, well, there's this plus this. And then the other side was saying, yeah, but it's Jesus and all the laws that came before Jesus. And Paul is reminding them that Jesus was the fulfillment of the law that Jesus alone saves. And he says, I tell you this so that no one may deceive you by fine-sounding arguments. See, Jesus had taken something very complex and offered himself in a clear and perfect picture as to not confuse people so they could encounter him. And people were trying to make it difficult. There were fine-sounding arguments. See, Jesus plus anything is false teaching. And Paul goes on in chapter 2 and verse 5. He says, for though I'm absent with you in the body, Paul's saying, though I'm not there, I'm present with you in spirit and delight to see how disciplined you are, how firm your faith in Christ is. Paul's kind of telling them what they're doing well. He's saying, look, I see that you are disciplined in what you're doing, that you're after the case of Christ, that you're after sharing the gospel, and your faith is really firm. You keep moving forward in your faith. So then, just as you received Christ Jesus as Lord, continue. See, many of the people had seen this event where they received Jesus. When we hear the word received, we often think of something passive. Like, I sit here, you bring me a chicken sandwich, I receive the chicken sandwich. But the actual Greek language here is, just as you come and take Christ as Lord... That just as you come and take Christ Jesus as Lord, it's actually something that is both active while it's available for you and to you. That Paul is saying, yes, all of you took this step to come and take Christ as your Lord. Continue then to live your lives in him, rooted and built up in him, strengthened in the faith as you were taught and overflowing with thankfulness. Now, there are three things here that I want to point out. When it says continue to live your lives in him, some translations actually say continue to walk in him. Like, we don't walk with enemies. We walk with friends. Like, we walk in relationships. Paul is hitting on something that anyone and everyone knows here that it's more than a transaction that's supposed to have with, happen with Jesus, where we go give Jesus the high five moment. It's about the fact that now that Christ is in us, that we are walking on a journey. That it's not just a one moment thing, that many of the people in these churches had taken it as, oh yeah, I high five Jesus that one Sunday, or I high five Jesus at that one church camp, and I had that event where now I have Jesus but they weren't fully taking root of the idea that they, they not only had received Jesus, they were still receiving Jesus. That he had given them salvation, but he was now giving them sanctification. That life needed to be centered around Jesus. Rooted. That's an agricultural term. This spring, uh, I had some potatoes that were starting to get sprouts on them right as the quarantine happened. And I'm a go-getter, go-out person, and quarantine was like crazy for me. I, I did not like being stuck at home. I didn't like uh, being there all the time. I'm just, I'm a go-getter, go-person. And so um, when I'm stuck in a situation that I can't get out of, I often make things up to do. And so I had these potatoes that were sprouting, and Laura had these huge flower pots on our front porch. If you've at any point driven by my house in the last few months, just know there are about 20 pounds of potatoes in each one of those pots because I planted them. Now, I stuck them in the dirt, and I covered them up. And as the plants began to grow, I put more dirt on top of the plants. And as I did, things began to happen. The plants began to grow. Flowers began to grow on the, on the plants. Potatoes began to grow under, under the gra ground. You see, I didn't get potatoes overnight. 
those became potatoes over a period of time in a process. No farmer sows seed and expects a crop that day. When Paul's describing this, he's making sure that he's speaking to the relational people in the room. He's making sure that he speaks to the culture of agriculture in the room. And he says, and built up in him. Paul is speaking to those who have been builders and constructors. And there was a phrase that we use today, Rome wasn't built in a day. And it means, it means that quite simply, you can't get everything done in a day. That God's purpose begins, that we, be, we begin to follow in God's purpose as we meet him, but growth is a process. He says, strengthened in the faith as you were taught. See, it's one thing to hear the word, it's another to begin to do the word. We don't do the word in order to follow the rules, we do the word because God was the fulfillment of the rules. Jesus was the fulfillment of the rules. We follow in relationship. We build over time. We allow God's word to take root. This is one of the reasons why people fall away from the church because they hear that there's this salvation moment, but they don't understand that God wants to do a continual work of transformation in our lives over time through our circumstances. And he says, and overflowing with thankfulness. Live your life refers to living in relationship with God. Being rooted refers to that process of agriculture, being built up, a process of construction. You see, maturity is a process. How arrogant would it be for someone to walk into the room at a new job and be like, I have arrived. I'm here. Look at me. See, the reality is it's very arrogant to walk into the presence of God and say, I have arrived. The reality is that God is now in the room and God can now do a work with one who could never arrive on their own. See, maturity is a process. A walk with God is not just something we do once. It's the way our life is to go. I think so many people want to get to a place of spiritual success where they look like and act like life is all together and the reality is many of us think that should happen overnight but it actually happens as a part of the process it happens as a part of the process by letting god take root in our heart ed Cantor said this quote one time it really takes 15 years to be an overnight success it took another 10 years for others to consider me an overnight night success i actually found it quite offensive this idea that once I know Jesus, I often hear people in conversation, oh, I know, I know God loves me. I know, oh, yeah, yeah, that whole Jesus died on the cross, rose from the dead thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, I know. We talk about that every Easter. But the reality is when that remains at the center and the gravity of that, that if God doesn't give his son to die on the cross, we're all hopeless. That there is no hope. That not only... Did he give his son to die on the cross? He gave us his son to walk with us. He gave us the Holy Spirit to build us up, to grow us up, to transform us. Paul goes on in verse 8 to say, See to it that no one takes you captive through hollow, deceptive philosophy. You see, Jesus came to free the people from the law and to free the people from false teaching. They were beginning to fall back in to both of those places. There was a, a pull and a drift happening. He says, through hollow and deceptive philosophy, which depends on human tradition and the elemental spiritual forces of this world, you see there's a tide that wants to pull us away from Christ. There's a tide that wants to pull Jesus away. Have you ever felt a current See, I think there's kind of one current that we might have felt when you think about like the ocean, right? I remember as a kid going to play in the ocean, my parents sitting on the beach and, you know, you play and you get focused and you're playing with sand and you're watching the wind and the waves go out and you're jumping in the waves and all of a sudden you look up and you're like, wait, mom and dad were right there. Where are mom and dad? Only to realize that you've slowly scooted your way down the beach and you're almost a building away 
See, Paul is telling them about this current that will slowly drag them down the beach away from him. The people were settling for this transactional moment. This is what happens when people lose excitement about Jesus. This is what happens when people lose their hunger for God's word, for scripture. This is what happens when we're like, ah, you know, I can be a Christian, but I really don't have to be a part of the family of God. I really don't have to. Yes. But I've never watched anyone walk away from the family of God and stay healthy. Because we were made to live life together. And Paul saw this drift that was dangerous. And he's telling the people, hey, keep your head up. Keep your eyes on me. Keep me at the center so you don't begin to drift away. Paul is inviting them away from this transactional mindset of I meet Jesus and then move on with my life to a transformational life which says Jesus is the purpose of all life. And then there's another current. It's a little more violent. You see, it will not just slowly pull you away. It'll pull you into decisions that rip you away from Jesus. A few years ago, Bucky Kramer and I were fishing. And uh, I love to fish Sugar Creek and we were, we were fishing for smallmouth. I was kind of excited. It had been dry. The creek was kind of reasonably low. It was about the right depth. I'm like, oh, it's going to be a great day. So we started up the creek. We always go up the creek early and come back later. And as we went up, you know, we kind of fought the current a little bit, but it wasn't bad at all. And I kept noticing, man, I'm getting tired. The further we went, the more tired that I got. And I started looking, and I'm like, man, the water has raised several inches. I didn't realize it had rained north of us three inches the night before. And at some point, I'm like, hey, Kramer, we probably need to get going. The, the water's getting to where it's not even fun to fish right now. Like, the water's just screaming away with our bait. It's just, it's not even fun. And we got to a certain spot, and I had dreaded the whole way trying to kind of cross in a higher current. Really, it was about the fact, it wasn't about the fact that I couldn't swim, and it was about the fact that I was going to have to swim it with my fishing rod in my hand. And I really deeply value my fishing rods. So as we began to kind of cross, you know, Kramer's a big dude, and he's kind of holding strong, and, like, the current is taking me. And I'm making progress toward the side, and finally I'm like, Kramer, grab my arm. I'm in trouble. And at the end of the day, I think I would have been fine, but I didn't lose my fishing rod because Kramer grabbed my shoulder. You see, there is a current that wants to violently rip you away from God, that wants to pull you away so that you lose connection with God. And it tells you that Jesus can just be an accessory to your life. You see, we meet Jesus. Now, Jesus wants to be in the center of our life. So we, have, we meet Jesus. We, we receive Jesus. We, at some moment, say, you know what? God offers his son for salvation. Um, I'm going to receive his son. But see, it's really easy for things to begin to pull us away from Jesus. I mean, you know, maybe it's my desire to matter and mean something and have an identity. And so I'll put my ID here, you know, and, and say that that. That, that's pretty important for me to think that I'm well thought of. Maybe that's a weakness for you. And in those moments where you're afraid that that will be taken away, you are tempted to push Jesus to the side. Maybe it's, maybe it's your money, your, your, your money. You, you, you say, you know what, I, I'm willing to follow Jesus, but don't let it impact my money. Don't, don't do it. And so, you know, that's kind of on the table. And any time that it comes to focusing on Jesus, but it impacts your, your bottom line, you're, you're tempted to say, you know what, I'll put that in the middle. Maybe, maybe it's your hobbies. I and mean, there's my Florida fishing lot. Maybe it's your vacations. We like to go to Florida and I always on, on vacation and I always like to go fishing. And so uh, maybe, maybe it's your hobbies. And all of a sudden you throw that on the table like, hey, I'll follow Jesus, but I, I go on that vacation. I, I'll follow Jesus, but hey, look, it's not going to interfere with what I love to do. And, but before long, 
before long, maybe it's your schedule, but before long, all of a sudden, these things have pushed Jesus to the outside of your life. All of a sudden, Jesus isn't the center. And see, here's the problem. Jesus does not want to be an accessory to your life. See, these things are not necessarily bad. Those hobbies, your, your, your resources, even your identity can be leveraged and used for Jesus, but none of those things make good gods. None of those things will give you the fullest hope. They can be an accessory, but they cannot be a priority over Jesus. You see, Jesus refuses to be an accessory in your life. See, so many people, so many people have Jesus as an accessory in their life. Paul is telling the people, hey, Jesus has to be the center of it all. Colossians 2 verse 9 says, for in Christ the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. If that's the fullness of God, then nothing else can live in its place. And in Christ, you've been brought to fullness. Paul is reminding the people, hey, you have been given something incredible. He's the head over every power and every authority. In him, you were also circumcised with a circumcision not performed by human hands. Your whole self ruled by the flesh was put off when you were circumcised by Christ. What he's saying here is God did in your heart what you couldn't do. That's an incredible gift. He will only be at the center of your life. Having been buried with him in baptism, having put all these things below him, having said these things don't matter as much as Jesus, he says, through your faith in the working of God who raised him from the dead, you were also raised in him. When you were dead in your sins, in the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made you alive with Christ. He forgave us all of our sins. Having canceled the charge of our legal indebtedness. What he's saying here is you were in prison. Now Paul understood being in prison because he was currently imprisoned for proclaiming the gospel while he was writing this letter. He said it stood against us and condemned us. He has taken it away nailing it to the cross and having disarmed the powers and authorities he made a public spectacle of them triumphing over them by the cross you know what i love see god has a way of taking what is broken broken and making it beautiful he doesn't always do it overnight but it's a process he wants to carry out in all of his children that he loves. You see, in our culture, we often use a cross and it's a paperweight or a jewelry or an accessory to our life. It's something we just put in our, you know, we might wear a cross on our neck or symbolically uh, have a cross around. Do you realize that in Jesus' day, the cross symbolized the most despicable thing on earth? It wasn't just designed to kill men on. It was actually designed to publicly humiliate broken men. And in Jesus' day, in the Roman Colosseums, they would place, and even after in the Roman Colosseums, they would place Christ followers in the middle of these massive shows of the powers of the day. And they would kill them or use them in games and humiliate and embarrass them. It looked like the Roman Empire was winning. But this early church that was going about sharing the gospel, 2,000 years later, we are speaking the name of this church in Colossae. With broken people, with broken roots, with broken history, and a messed up past. You know what else is interesting? All those huge shows of power that the Roman government had in those Colosseums. Guess what symbol stands in the middle of a Roman Colosseum today? That ugly, despicable cross. 
stands as a reminder that the resurrection of Jesus isn't just enough, just something to know about. It's something to center your life around. You know, God offers. He lays convictions on our hearts. So often religion wants to lay guilt and shame. But God offers conviction. And if you could honestly say today, hey, I've kind of pushed Jesus to be an accessory in my life. Maybe I'm not feeling the fire in my faith like I used to. Maybe I'm not experiencing the growth that I thought I would. Maybe today's a perfect time to say, God, you can have all of this stuff. Because in your hands, it's leveraged for good. Maybe today is the day where you recognize that other things have caused you to drift from God. And some of you think that if you feel guilty or shameful right now, you had a religious experience. God doesn't want your guilt or your shame. Over and over, the theme of repenting comes up. This opportunity to go to God and to turn our direction and begin to be transformed. Can we be a people that rather making a big show of God are a people who are tr transformed by God so he can show his glory? I love you, Bethel. Have a great week. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Are you ready to take your next step? We would love to hear from you. You can send an email to hello at Bethel.us. You can send us a message on Facebook, or you can let us know in the Bethel app. And speaking of the Bethel app, take a moment, if you haven't already, to go to your app store and search Bethel Putco to download our app. There's all kinds of great resources in the app. You can listen to messages, you can view the messages from Sunday morning, and you can also fill out a digital connect card. You can do that today and each week to let us know that you're tuning in. You can also find some great information about our Bethel Kids Ministry and our Be The One Student Ministries. Also in the app, you can give. It's one of three ways you can give. With online giving at Bethel.us slash give in our app, Bethel Putco, or through text. Hey, thanks again for joining us. We hope you have a great day and know that you are loved. <laughs>